Speaking of coming back, we are back here on Corporate Report Radio, and we are joined by none other than James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, FullyHexes.com, FoodWorldOrder.com, CyberspaceWar.com, and NewWorldNextWeek.com. So the moment you've all been waiting for, the (laughs) arrival of James, let's all give him a round of applause. James, thanks again for coming on tonight to go over Food World Order. Thank you so much. Thank you for even that intro. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> heartfelt, heartfelt. All right. Well, uh, I, as always, we have a ton of uh, food and health and environment information to go over tonight. So where do you want to start? Well, as as you and I bandied about some some thoughts about stories and what you were just talking about in the previous segment, so we made the switch and bumped it up. I had posted a few days ago, and it comes from UPI, Japan plans robot farm in disaster area. Japan says a futuristic robot farm will be built on land swamped by the March 11 tsunami as part of an an experimental government project. The Ministry of Agriculture project will see unmanned tractors working the fields of the farm on a 600-acre site in the disaster zone, so reports the Telegraph. Robots will also box the produce grown on the farm, including rice, wheat, soybeans, fruits, and vegetables. This experimental farm, James, will be located on a site in northeast Japan's Miyagi Prefecture that was flooded in last year's tsunami. Some of the comments I got on on this posting on Food World Order says, if we we can't work there to farm this, why would we be able to eat the food that would be farmed there? Do you have any kind of answer to that? Am I missing something? Oh, f- no, I think that's spot on. I, I like that comment. Whom do they plan to feed this produce, produce to? I certainly will not buy it or eat it. And uh, I think that's exactly the point. Um, and of course, it, I think the overall idea is not just the the radiation, but also the the sort of tsunami damage that's been done in the area and all of that. But but obviously, I mean, if if you can't even be working in the area, why would you eat the produce from there? Why would we want to develop technologies to help farm radioactive contaminated areas it's it's just boggles the mind why they would even come up with that there are so many <laughs> and that's i think the way james you know we probably end up looking at at a lot of these stories as as double edged kind of sorts because on the one hand you look at these advancements and it you know we're we're living in the 21st century there are amazing you know mind blowing futuristic you know advancements that have been made but then we see it's like aren't there so much cooler things we could be doing with with robots yeah i wonder if anyone back in the 1950s thought you know in the 21st century we'll be using robots to farm areas of land that have been irradiated for millions of years by nuclear reactors which have melted down i, I don't think that was part of the uh, the future that was being sold to us no and they and we see them all kind of come back and around in in our media through you know whatever kind of sci-fi or dystopic films and i may throw in a reference to one of those at, at the end of this but uh, I guess as long Is as we're talking green? about... It's going to be soil and green. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's much worse than that in a way. But as long as we were talking about technologies, the first story I was going to mention tonight comes out of Australia. DNA mix spray to foil thieves. McDonald's to use new anti-theft spray fighting back against thieves by blasting suspected robbers with an invisible DNA spray. This is happening in McDonald's all around Australia. The New York Times reported in 2010 that this had been going on, you know, in the Netherlands. Selecta DNA is the company, quote, non-toxic, non-allergenic, and perfectly safe to deploy. It meets all Australian standards, end quote. Again, James, amazing 21st century advancements, but again, being used to track and trace us. Exactly right. And this is being introduced in a way that that I don't think many people could dispute. I mean, if you are a, a robber or there's someone who's been, a, a, you know, trying to flee the scene of something, well, then sure, a company sprays you or whatever and uh, tracks you down. But the, the point really is that this technology, of course, isn't just going to be used in those cases. And if they're already rolling this out for the corporate world, can you imagine how they might have been using this behind the scenes, the intelligence agencies and whatever that have had their hands on this technology? 
technology, presumably for mm-hmm. a lot longer, and uh, are probably already implemented it to keep t- tabs on whoever they want to keep tabs on, really. Um, it's it, the the implications of this are scary, but it's one of those stories where you go, oh, you know, good, get those robbers. And it's it, it's interesting. I find that it is a place like McDonald's, which that's you know, this is cheap fast food. Is there that much theft yeah. that they would that they would have to deploy something like this again? You would imagine it. It's like, wouldn't you have this, you know, in a Tiffany's or you know, a jewelry store and those kind of places? But right. I guess those kind of places aren't in the kind of places where people are robbing fast food places. Or it, at the very least, it's a good way to get it in front of lots of people very quickly. You know, billions served. There's lots of people around the world who are going to see the development and deployment of this technology, and it's going to make a lot of headlines. And that's, I think, more the point of this story than just the uh, the technology itself. And it won't be long, and, and maybe it already has happened <clears throat> before before it makes its way into, you know, into, again, the media and, the, and popular culture. There'll be movies and sitcoms where that'll be some little funny plot line. In whatever you know, yep. concocted. That's the way story the propaganda rollout inevitably works. And uh, and again, I think it's it's really quite fascinating. And as you say, I mean, it's remarkable the things that can be done with this technology. But of course, it's just going to be used to track, surveil, trace people, and uh, and we're just being indoctrinated so that when it's revealed that they're using it in police investigations and it gets you know suspected, whatever fill in the blank terrorist or whatever domestic insurgent or whatever label they want to come up with will be indoctrinated to sort of accept it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're only listening to the terrorists and we're only spraying selecta DNA on McDonald's thieves, right? Um, I, you know, I did want to comment as you were going over some of the day's headlines in the beginning part of the show. And as long as we're, you know, still kind of talking about food, but talking about technologies and you were you speaking about the SOPA Act, Ron, you know, it's, it's nice to have somebody like Ron Wyden here in Oregon. You know, I'm vaguely familiar with the name, like I've heard it before, but I really don't know much about him or his legislative history. What What's the story on him? Well, uh, again, I'm not ready to kind of stand up here and, you know, give a testimony about him. He seems to be one of those folks in Congress, one of those kind of small few that you can look at them and generally kind of say, I pretty much, you know, agree with just about every way they vote. And... He and not necessarily our, bought and sold by the various lobbies, no, or at least not. You know, perhaps there may be something there. Again, I'm not saying you know Ron Wyden's you know un you know untouchable. I I haven't dug that that deeply into it. But when we're talking about issues of you know food and talking about issues of war and talking about issues of the internet and technologies, he pretty much seems to come down on the on the right side. I was going to say Ron Wyden and our other Oregon Senator, Jeff Merkley. I think in the country, when the Senate was voting on the NDAA, they were the only, Oregon was the only state where both senators voted against the NDAA, thankfully, for whatever end that means. <laughs> yeah, well, I, at least they're on the right side of history. Um, it's just absolutely amazing to me that that anyone would be willing to put their name to that because uh, I think history will judge the actions of the, the, the senators and Congress critters who have allowed this to happen. And uh, it's not, it's, their names are not going to go down as mm-hmm. uh, revered as, as the greats among uh, American history, that's for sure. One of the other stories you were talking about at the very top, of course, was the Marines urinating on corpses story. And that reminded me one of, you know, how many times we do see these kind of sort of desecration, urine, kind of scatological stories kind of weave throughout the news and, and throughout the culture. There is an amazing play, this kind of made me think of it on a sidebar, called Urine Town, about a Malthusian future where you can only use pay toilets because everybody, they need the water because all the other water has been ruined, so you're not allowed to waste you know, that water that could be saved by, you know, peeing in an alley, you have to pay for the privilege and they'll collect your water. And it's it's a musical. It's very fun. You're in town. <laughs> very fun. Okay. It, it sounds it, about as enjoyable as Hannibal the mu- or Cannibal the Musical. Yeah, maybe in a way. And and actually that, that I seeing that play was probably one of the earlier things that I was like, Thomas Malthus. I was like, Oh, okay. And they you know, they talk about him and mention him in the in the program for the show. 
at this point, I can't and remember. I, and that's interesting because I really do think that the uh, the water shortage meme is one that's going to be pushed more and more in the coming years. Mm. So keep your eye out for you're in town. Exactly. And then the I other thing expect I expect to be I, saying that on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I made my notes on the first half of the show. See, as I, you know, I try and tune it so I can I can chime in and be able to kind of pick it up and we can continue to go here. Um, Berkey. Always topical. But on the note of thieves, there's a, a very interesting story about restaurants used fryer oil, used fryer oil attracting thieves up on Food World Order I'd like to get into. From, I, again, there must be an Australian theme here, but I take it from the Sydney Morning Herald. Companies that collect used cooking grease from U.S. restaurants have turned to all forms of sleuthing in recent years. Private investigators, surveillance cameras, and still containers full of used fryer oil are slipping through their fingers. For years, restaurants had to pay companies to take away the old grease, which was used mostly in animal feed. And then some gave it away. Some made biodiesel on converted car engines. But with the demand for biofuel rising, fryer oil now trades on a booming commodities market. And there are other stories that we have on Food World Order about the commodities market, about orange juice plummeting. But essentially, they're busy with murders in meth labs, and so the cops aren't going after things like this. But this is another thing that we see just as we see pharmacies bracing themselves for rampant thievery going on in, in those places. And James, we just talked about McDonald's, you know, deploying amazing technologies. All of these things are going to start to pop up as the controlled demolition of the world economies kind of continue apace. But the funny part about this, and this is pointed out, an episode of The Simpsons has Homer Simpson trying to make a quick buck selling grease. So, again, this has been in media, and I don't know off the top of my head what year that goes back to, what episode of The Simpsons. Are, but essentially, it's been in the news, but no one thought about it. It's well, been out I trust, there. Uh, trust James Evan Pilato to come up with The Simpsons <laughs> angle on the story. Um, but I, in my mind, the media reference that raises is Fight Club, where they're uh, digging oh, through the the, uh, the trash of the uh, liposuction clinic to get the, the human fat to make their mm. soap. And that's the image that comes to my mind. It's a particularly gruesome one. That's, I, I was going to say, I was like, which is much more, much more graphic and gross than the Simpsons Lard of the Dance episode. I suppose so. Yes, yeah, so let's keep it in the Simpsons realm. Well, but on the note of the biofuels, that, that's really the heart of this story. Um, really interesting story from Human Events uh, the other day. EPA finds companies because they didn't use a fuel that doesn't exist. And it goes on to talk about how the EPA is... Uh, this, levying $6.8 million worth of fines against various companies for raising the quota for 2012 for the uh, for the use of an oil, a biofuel oil that uh, does not exist and there is no pro there is zero production of it. So p companies are now being fined for not using this thing that does not exist. And uh, basically it's another example of how the government steps in and uh, tries to legislate into reality things that don't exist, it's a technology that does not yet exist. And basically just find people until until it it happens hmm. um, just a ridiculous story but uh, just as, just one sense in which the EPA can take over all of the uh, the green fascism that uh, has been going on in other realms you'll have to send me that link I had I had not seen that story but that almost reminds me of, of the sort of you know the shell game of it all like the marijuana stamp tax what was that it was essentially oh if you, you know if you want to have hemp you got to have the stamp but we never made any of the stamps for you to be able to have it so it's illegal essentially yeah sounds about right no that's how they they do so many of their tricks and that's how they try to convince people that they need uh you know a permit to carry a gun when the second amendment of course uh, guarantees the right to bear arms but but then they, if they make it into a permit system then in like new york or places like that they can just basically make it pretty much impossible for anyone to get a permit so it it becomes de facto illegal and uh and that's just the color of law that they always love to use. Mm -hmm. James, something else I was going to mention, Berkey water, as long as we were kind of talking about urine, I was thinking about liquids. I today actually just re-upped and got new Berkey filters that should be on their way soon. And water filtering is such kind of a simple, easy way. And like I think a lot of things in the food and health and environment world, the more you remove the the petrochemicals and the perfumes and all that stuff, and the more you're away from it, then when you have 
contact with it you realize how how bad it was before we realize now that oh our our you know our black berkey element filters you know i haven't replaced them in in too long and you can start to taste it in the water so it's the same thing then when you kind of come in contact with you know whether that's nasty detergent or you know or the cologne someone had on you know just a little bit ago i saw you know and and talked to for a moment outside my door you come back inside you're like oh my god that you know that stench you know i you'd never notice it when you're immersed in it but the more you take yourself away from it you can you can start to realize and kind of breathe freely that's, so that's an interesting analogy in so many ways because uh, for me that's kind of the image mm-hmm. of what it's like when you're uh, waking up to the real political reality after having been immersed in the in the fantasy world for so long you start to realize oh that was a terrible stench i was breathing in all that time and i never noticed it because i was never outside of it but that to me is what uh, what it's like when you find out that all the uh, all the politicians are bought and sold and pay for and that uh, it's all just a political puppet theater but yeah no the point's well taken absolutely that uh, that people who aren't filtering their water in some way or just taking it from the, the taps. I mean, uh, I, I couldn't imagine doing that here in Japan anyway. It's one of those mm-hmm. urban legends that get passed around. Who knows if it's true, but I had this uh, friend with, who, who said that the litmus paper when he tried testing water uh, out of the tap here turned black. <laughs> it's just one of those stories that's probably not true, but encapsulates a dream. <laughs> and you, yeah, you'd almost be too afraid to attempt it yourself. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Something else that, that again, as as I think so many of these things kind of revolve around, it revolves, you know, this, it's, I think, been said in one way or another, you know, the revolution starts in your own, you know, medicine cabinet and in your own refrigerator and in your own kitchen. So just as I'm thinking about, you know, my own water filter here in the apartment, also talking about, you know, packaged and, and canned foods and my girlfriend and I were just talking about this, you know, two days ago. And then today, as I'm kind of collecting all my media, as I start to put it together for my big kind of weekend media push with the, you know, the radio show and as well now these Food World Order episodes, an article popped up from grist.org. Five reasons or, or five packaged foods, rather, you never need to buy again or even probably never should buy again. And it talks about buying soup. You know, of course, in a can, which God knows, you know, what else is in there in addition to the things that we we do kind of know. But it's the convenience. So same thing, canned beans, all of those things that you can maybe try and remove and start to do a little bit more on your own. We're we're here trying to make those kind of baby steps ourselves. The revolution starts at home. The revolution starts when we look in the mirror. Uh, Let's take a short break. We'll be back to finish up tonight's broadcast right after this. Okay, here we are in the final closing minutes of this edition of Corbett Report Radio. I am your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and we've been honored to be blessed by the presence of James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com and FoodWorldOrder.com for the latter half of tonight's broadcast, going over some interesting headlines from FoodWorldOrder.com. So if you're not keeping an eye on FoodWorld, FoodWorldOrder.com for those types of headlines, well, why not? And, uh, of course, there's also MediaMonarchy.com, where uh, James goes over the, the headlines on, on so many other issues. And there's CyberspaceWar.com, HolyHexes.com, uh, NavigatingNetflix.com. Let's not forget that one. Um, so, James, uh, thanks again for, for going through the, uh, the some of the, at least one aspect of the Monarchy Kingdom uh, today, as always. And uh, let's t- tell people about your uh, your own broadcast that's coming up in a few short hours. Uh, thanks so much, man. I, as you were kind of reeling reeling through the list there, that brings us back to the beginning. I need a robot farm to help, you know, run my run the media <laughs> empire. Because <laughs> all these robot interests, uh, again, as you were kind of talking about with Fukushima Update, with, with all the things that we're trying to do, and so many passions and, and so many ways, it's just tough, you know, of course, to keep them all going constantly at full speed but i return to the airwaves tomorrow i of course after the new year i took a week off and of course james you and i took last week off from from this food world order show but i'll return to the airwaves tomorrow with episode 246 and you know there's so many things to go over again that i go over in the world of like we call pop a culture 
and the murder and the mayhem and the media and the memes. And we also use a lot of clips and a lot of music. And I essentially kind of took my college radio programming and even theatrical sound design that I used to do back on the East Coast and kind of put it into an alternative media show. And as I've been saying more and more lately, it is the Real News Remixed. That's right, my friends. And if you don't, if you haven't tuned in, you don't know what you're missing. So I hope you go to MediaMonarchy.com to find out how to do so. And uh, on that note, um, I'm sure there are so many different things that, that you'll be going over tomorrow. But uh, anything particularly interesting on the plate? Oh my goodness. Yeah, I have so many, many things, whether it's, you know, films like you discussed that I put out on navigatingnetflix.com, films that are, you know, that are worthwhile and, and worth taking the time to watch on Netflix. Or some of the weird occult things going on, of course, the bizarre speculation surrounding the Beyonce baby and all of the sort of Illuminati trappings and will play, you know, New music and old music and just so many other things. I guess as the show will start here in about 12 hours, I'll start to get my ducks in a row and grab a quick nap. But it'll be, you know, all systems go tomorrow. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to that Real News Remixed, as you say. And I often take it for granted that the listeners out there know about New World Next Week and are perhaps uh, viewers of that uh, program. But if they're not, I really hope you will tune into newworldnextweek.com to find the latest episode and go through some of the back archives. Um, we've been doing it for over two years now. So mm -hmm. uh, is that right? Two years? It is. I know. I, I sometimes stop and go, man, we have. Yeah. Two years, uh, pretty much every single week, unless we're taking a, a break. But that doesn't happen very often. So, right. um, so we, uh, the latest episode: Obama versus U.S., U.S. Israel versus Iran, Eugenesis versus everyone. Uh, now up on youtubecom slash report blip.tv, and all the other ways that you can access that that program. So, if you haven't yet, please go to newworldnextweek.com. On that note, James, thank you once again for gracing us with your presence, and I'm looking forward to doing this again next week on the broadcast. And tomorrow night will be Corbett Report Radio's Friday Night Highlights, where we'll be going through some previous work from CorbettReport.com. And I believe we're going to be highlighting some things that I've done on Iran in the past. But don't hold me to that, because we'll see what develops in the next 24 hours. But until then, thank you for tuning in for tonight's broadcast, and I'm looking forward to doing it again tomorrow night. <laughs>